Hello, everybody, and welcome. Our next talk is going to be by Dr. Tucker Balch. He's a professor at Georgia Tech and a chief scientist at Lucina Research. He teaches one of the most popular courses on quant finance called Machine Learning for Traders. His talk is titled, A Guided Tour of Machine Learning for Traders. Please welcome Dr. Balch. Well, the <clears throat> thanks very much. Um, one thing I want to give everybody, I want to set expectations at the right level and give everybody an opportunity to his, escape, okay? Um, so uh, what I mean by that is um, this talk is, for, is not for machine learning experts, okay? It's for people with a quantitative background that are curious to get, about getting an intuitive feel for what machine learning for trading might be like, okay? So it's not going to be nuts and bolts, uh, detailed, quantitative machine learning, it's going to be a high-level gestalt uh, feeling for machine learning, okay? Anybody want to escape now? No? Okay, all right. Oh, and this, this picture is supposed to represent the person who's tired about all the, all the buzz about machine learning. Um, that was the best one I could find. Uh, okay, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a professor at Georgia Tech. I teach courses there in artificial intelligence and finance. My background originally was in uh, mobile robotics, and I focused on machine learning for robots. And a few years back, I became interested in applying those same algorithms uh, to finance. And uh, it turns out that, uh, that trading is a lot harder than robots, at least in my opinion. Um, and uh, uh, one, a, a, a real leader in um, machine learning who is involved with the uh, Quantopian uh, machine, uh, Michael Kearns, uh, I was talking with him once about this problem. Uh, and, you know, academics, um, which I am one, uh, think that uh, machine learning applied to the market must be easy because it's so accurately instrumented. You can get all the numbers, you can get all the data, and you just turn the machine learning crank and there's the answer. Um, and uh, Machine learning is done, uh, conducted very much in uh, computer vision. So uh, he made this analogy. It's like, it's like when you're trying to use computer vision to recognize a zebra and the zebra is changing its color. Uh, that's what the market's like. The market is trying to defeat you. And that's why uh, machine learning for trading is tough. Um, anyways, uh, I did want to tell you a little bit about my course. Um, I've, I've taught uh, two massive online uh, courses. Uh, initially, I taught one on Coursera. It's had over 170,000 students. Some of them are here. Raise your hand if you. So thanks for, so they, they liked it, right? So they, they, they still came here after they took my course. Um, <clears throat> there's a newer version of the course that's now at uh, Udacity which I think is a better course. There's some people who are taking that course now, right? Raise your hand. Okay, there are fewer of them, and they're a little bit more shy. So um, anyways, uh, but this, this, this new one is much better. So if, if you're interested in some of the things I talk about here, uh, Google, Balch, Udacity, the course is free, so I'm not uh, um, trying to you know, sell you anything. But uh, if you like this, uh, you might, might enjoy that course. It's free unless you're getting a degree. Okay, so those people had to pay. Sorry. It, it's part of the um, online master's degree at Georgia Tech. If, if you pay, we actually grade your assignments. If you don't, uh, you just um, see how they, how they turn out. Um, <clears throat> I'm also a chief scientist at Lucena Research. Uh, one reason I mentioned that is I'm going to show you some examples of how we apply machine learning at Lucena Research. Um, and in particular, I'm going to show you an example of a, of a new strategy that we're building with our partners, uh, Psych Signal, who are here. Where's Psych Signal? Uh, um, anyways, I'll connect. If, if you like what you see, I'll connect you with them uh, later on. Uh, anyways, we're a um, we're a uh, spinoff um, from Georgia Tech, uh, and uh, we we use machine learning for price forecasting, hedging, uh, machine learning based stock screening, uh, and also uh, we deliver uh, model portfolios. Uh, our infrastructure at Lucena is Python based, which is of course, also uh, what uh, Quantopian does. Uh, so there's uh, actually a lot of uh, resonance now in the field with uh, Python as a, as a great language for, for doing this stuff. Um, okay, big picture. 
Um, there's a lot of buzzwords out there that mean essentially the same thing. Um, in fact, uh, there's probably another not so buzzy word um, that means the same thing, which is statistics. So uh, lots of times uh, when machine learning people talk about what they do and there's a statistician in the audience, they just say, we did that 20 years ago. Um, so uh, I would argue that uh, machine learning, big data, predictive analytics are all about the same thing. It's about gathering lots of data and using it um, either to make predictions uh, or to build a policy. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk at the end about something called reinforcement learning, which is a little bit different than what a lot of people think of as machine learning, um, but, but I'll get to that in a moment. Um, I'm going to focus on something called uh, a, a branch of machine learning called supervised learning. And the reason it's called supervised learning is because you have this learner you're trying to train, you give it some data, and uh, you tell it what the right answer is. So it's like training a dog, <laughs> you know, in some sense. Um, so, you know, here's the information. You know, here, for instance, if you're thinking about stock prices, the, the information may be um, technical indicators or fundamental indicators, you know, as they are today. And the right answer is uh, what was the price several days later. And you show it thousands and thousands and thousands of those examples, you know, input, output, and uh, it should eventually sink in, you know, and it can make the prediction. Now, there's uh, two types, really, of, of, um, of these sorts of models. Um, one type is classification. So a traditional example there is you might show a machine learner pictures of different animals and ask it to uh, predict which animal it is. Um, or in our case, um, we might say, hey, here's the situation of this stock today. Classify it as a buy or a sell. So uh, classification, the other kind of um, use for these kinds of learners is regression. So instead of a classification, buy or sell, you might want a prediction of how much is the price going to change. So all that regression means is you're looking for a numerical answer as opposed to classifying it in, into one or two bins. Um, and then uh, at the end, I'm going to talk a bit about reinforcement learning. And uh, the difference from uh, the sorts of models that we build with supervised learning and reinforcement learning is reinforcement learning is a way to build policies. So what's a policy? A policy is something that tells you what to do. So this, this other sort of learning, you know, predicting future values, it's not telling you what you ought to do with that information. Uh, now, you, you might say, gee, if it predicts the price is going to go up, I ought to buy. But uh, there may be other subtleties there that aren't really covered by these sorts of methods. For instance, yeah, the prediction might be that the price is going to go up, but the certainty is fairly low. Um, a policy can take all of that into account, uh, you know, the, the certainty of the price change in conjunction with what you're going to do later uh, to make these recommendations for buying or selling. Okay, um, how to build a predictive model. So uh, we start with pairs of factors. I always call the input X and the thing that we're trying to predict Y. Uh, these factors might be, um, as I mentioned, technical features of stocks, might be fundamental features of stocks. Uh, y is usually uh, how much uh, the, the price of the stock changes. So if we're going to do regression, Y is how much the price changes. If we're going to do um, classification, Y might be, okay, I saw the price went up enough I would label that a buy or a sell. Oh, and by the way, if a question comes up while I'm going, uh, please, please ask, because I'm not sure I'm going to fill all the time. So <laughs> uh, we'll take questions as we go along. Uh, so I mentioned we have classification approaches, uh, regression. Again, classification is there's some small number of outcomes uh, or some small number of actions we ought to take. Regression is we're predicting a number. So there are um, many algorithms that solve this problem. So supervised learning isn't a 
algorithm, it's a problem. And these here are algorithms that solve that problem. Uh, you've probably heard of some of them. Uh, deep learning is, uh, is the, the, the latest um, uh, sexy new way to do supervised learning. And it's great. It's, uh, um, uh, it's, it's a very strong new method. I'm going to talk today about uh, KNN, which stands for K nearest neighbor, uh, and decision trees. And the reason I picked those two is I think they're um, intuitively, it, 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 it's easier to understand them than, than some of the other approaches. Um, okay, now when I was preparing this talk earlier this week, I was trying to think of, okay, what could I use as, as an example to uh, teach people about decision trees? And uh, in my, on my Facebook page, somebody posted this kind of vulgar meme. And I'm glad it's kind of fuzzy, so maybe you can't read it. Um, but it's, uh, uh, who should I vote for? And uh, I won't go into all the vulgar detail, but I'll start here at the, so it's a flow chart. It's a logical flow chart, and it starts at the top. Is shit broken? Um, now, if it's yes, you go down this branch. Who did it? Um, if it's rich people, then you should vote for Sanders. Um, anyways, I'm not going to linger here too much because, uh, um, but I thought uh, we'll clean it up a little bit and, uh, and turn it into a machine learning problem. Um, okay, so uh, here's the idea. We want to build a model that will predict who somebody's going to vote for. And uh, let's suppose we employed a um, survey team, and uh, they decided we should ask these four questions. We'll ask everybody we talk to, um, uh, do you believe the country is broken? What caused it? Uh, where do you stand on a woman's right to choose? What are your religious views? So we're going to ask, ask everybody that question. And then furthermore, so that's the X part. Those are the variables for which we're trying to predict the outcome, which is who they might vote for. So we asked them additionally, OK, who are you going to vote for? So now we have these examples, these pairs of data, the factors, and the outcomes. Now, I'm going to tell you later how to build a decision tree. But let's assume we have a decision tree. Uh, this is how you can use it. So we enter here. Uh, now, the reason it's called a decision tree um, is uh, uh, algorithmically or I guess theoretically is a better term, uh, trees have a certain description, which is there's their directed graph. Uh, you don't need to worry about this, but I just want to put it out there. They're directed graph, and they have no cycles. Um, and uh, it consists of interior nodes, which are usually yes, no questions, uh, and leaf nodes, which are essentially the answer. So. If you follow through this uh, decision tree, you know, are things broken? Yes. Who did it? Rich people. Sanders. <laughs> so when you reach a leaf, that's, uh, uh, that's your, your answer. Uh, now, a couple things to note here. Uh, if you remember, we, um, there were four factors that we queried people on. Uh, it, it, it may be that as you traverse this graph, you don't encounter a question about all of those features. In fact, uh, in this case, um, if, you don't think, sir, if you don't think things are broken, uh, these other questions don't matter. All that matters is um, do you support choice or not? Um, and just, I don't know if you can see it or not. So I'm not trying to be political. I just think it's funny, OK? Um, <laughs> anyways, if you come down this branch and you support choice, then Clinton is your, is your person. Uh, but note, we never encountered questions down this branch about, you know, who broke the, who broke the country. And the reason is uh, that decision trees sort of naturally uh, segregate the, the relevant questions according to the data. And that's an important uh, uh, feature of uh, decision trees. Okay, so enough about politics. Um, let's move on to stocks. Okay, we can build the same sort of tree, but to uh, classify stocks as buys or sells. So again, we're treating this as a classification problem. And I, I replaced these political questions with 
quantitative questions that we could ascribe, uh, values that we could ascribe to a stock. Now, um, one thing I want to comment, um, I see somebody taking a picture, which is fine, but I have no idea if this works, okay? <laughs> um, so, uh, 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 so maybe it does, but uh, if it does, then call me and let me know. Um, but uh, I'm just trying to illustrate that uh, it's built with quantitative, you know, binary quantitative questions that we can ask. So at each node here, there's a feature that we're concerned about. For instance, at the root node, we're looking at PE ratio. And then there's a threshold. So we look at the PE threshold of the stock. Uh, if it is, uh, at, we look at the PE ratio of the stock. If it's less than 15, then we go down this branch. Uh, then we ask another uh, binary question. This one is about 10-day um, uh, momentum. Is it less than 5%? No. Then we come down this branch and we reach a leaf and this means we classify the stock as most likely to go up. Um, and again, notice that um, when we went down this side, we didn't worry about RSI. Uh, and uh, uh, if we reach this leaf, we didn't worry about uh, MACD. Um, now, there's, there's no rule about this. It may be that um, uh, you have to consider each factor before you reach a leaf. It may be that you consider each factor several times. It just depends on the uh, shape and depth of the tree. Now, uh, I've shown you how this can work for classification. Uh, we can just as easily use decision trees for regression. So instead of having these leaves be a classification of a buy or a sell, they can be, you know, for that particular historical example, how much did the stock go up or down? And uh, if we had, um, let's suppose we had um, 30,000 examples. So that, that equates to uh, three months of data for all of the stocks in the S&P 500. That's 35,000 examples of what are these features today and what was the change in price after five days or 20 days or whatever. We have 30,000 examples of X's and Y's. If we built a perfect tree, it would have 30,000 leaves. Uh, perf what a perfect tree means is that um, every piece of data in your training set is represented in your tree. And it means if you were to query your tree with all of those examples of data, it would come up with exactly the correct answer. Now that's potentially a recipe for overfitting, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. But um, the, 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 the reason I'm bringing it up is to give you some idea of the size of these trees. So if you've got um, 30,000 leaves, some of the computer scientists ought to be able to tell me how deep is that tree. So the people at the, in the Georgia Tech course, huh? Log in. Okay, so what's, <laughs> it's a log base 2 of 30,000. What does that work out to be? I don't know. Um, I, 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 um, somebody's got to know log base 2 of 30. Okay, he'll calculate it for us. Um, anyways, what, um, what, what that equates to is, at most, how many, binary question, how many binary questions do you have to ask before you reach a leaf? And as soon as he gets it, we'll, uh, we'll move on before we get that answer. Um, Okay, who's heard of um, decision forests? Few people, okay. Um, what are forests made of? A bunch of trees, right? Um, so uh, a decision forest is exactly that. It's many, many decision trees. Um, now, a reasonable question is, where do all these trees come from? In other words, if I took my 30,000 uh, pieces of data, there's just one precise tree that represents it, right? Uh, well, the, the way that you um, create these different trees is uh, uh, you use a method actually, I think developed by Michael Kearns. Um, you take your training data and you grab not all of it, but a random handful and you build one tree. Then you grab another random handful and build another tree. And you repeat that for however many trees that you want to have. Now what's the advantage of this? Um, uh, it, it turns out um, that uh, it increases, uh, well, it reduces 
the opportunity for overfitting. Uh, it also uh, typically increases the accuracy. Oh, I left out one part. Um, suppose you have all these trees in your forest. How do you know what the answer is? Um, well, the answer is that you query each tree with the, the, the data that you're asking it about, and each tree will give you an answer. Okay, that, that's a um, up 2%. The next tree might say that's an up 1.5%. The next one might say that's uh, zero. Anyways, you take the mean of all those answers, uh, and that's the result for querying the forest. So what, how deep is my tree? 15? Okay, cool. So that's um, the reason that's important or uh, a reason for considering it is, you know, suppose you're a high frequency trader um, and you're concerned about speed. Uh, uh, you would typically build your trees overnight or, you know, you may spend days building your trees, but once you've got them built, uh, you can run them very, very fast because you've only got to ask 15 binary questions, which of course you can do, you know, billions of times uh, per second. Building the trees is sometimes time consuming. Uh, so let me tell you um, how to build a tree. Now, I, I, um, I'm not going to, um, uh, I'm sure you're disappointed that I'm not going to go into deep, deep detail about how to build trees, um, but I'll <laughs> touch it at a high level. Uh, first of all, you gather your data. Um, and again, we've always got our um, input variables, which I always call x. In this case, we've got three of them. So that means we're measuring three factors about each stock. And uh, I always consider that we just have one output variable um, because it's, it's trivial to build a model that can predict multiple output variables. You just, you just duplicate it and build a, another, another tree, but with the other output variable. Um, Anyways, we don't have just one sample. We've got thousands, right? So we've got all of our data. Now, we want to, now we're asking the question, which factor should we consider for our root node? Which of all these factors are we going to ask that first question on? And uh, you might be wondering, how can I choose? Why should I choose? Um, well, you want, essentially, you want at each level to ask the question that divides the data most effectively. Um, you're looking, uh, uh, you're, you're, um, it, it's an entropy, well, you know, for those of you who are, know about information theory, it's an entropy-like question. Uh, anyways, a, one way to answer that question, and, and typical approach, is we look at each of our input factors, x. Uh, so we've got 30,000 x1s. We've got 30,000 X2s and 3s, and we've got 30,000 Ys. Well, we take X1 and Y, and we look at the correlation between X1 and Y. And it may not be good, it may be good, but we just record what is that number, what is the correlation. We then test the same thing for the next factor and the next one. One of them is going to be better than the other. Um, and we take the one that has the highest correlation, and we use that as the root of our tree. So let's say that's, uh, um, I think it's PE ratio. Let's say it's PE ratio. The next question we have to answer is, what threshold are we going to use to split the data? Uh, there's, there are a number of different ways to answer that. But um, for instance, if you were trying to um, classify the data, you would want that threshold uh, such that when you set it, most of the um, Ys on one side are of one classification, and most on the other side are of another. So you might have, you know, 10,000 going down this side and 20,000 going down that side. That's if it's classification. If it's regression, typical thing to do is just split it in half. You find the value for that factor that divides your data in two. So uh, we started with 30,000 data points of Xs and Ys. Now we've got 15,000 and 15,000. We take all of those 15,000 that are less than our threshold uh, and build the left tree, and we take all the other ones and build the right tree. So I hope that I said it wasn't going to be too technical, but people are I'm scaring people away. Um, but uh, anyways, you just repeat. 
repeat, 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 repeat. You repeat exactly that approach to build your left tree, that approach to build the right tree. Eventually, when you split your data, there's, um, uh, uh, there's no more data left to split. You're at a leaf, and boom, you create a leaf. So that's how you build a tree. Let me move on now. Um, let me recap a little bit. Um, I talked about training. So for any type of uh, learner, there's a training phase and then a query phase. And in our case, this training phase is potentially time consuming, uh, but the query phase is usually quick. Uh, that's the main thing, main point I wanted to make there. Let me mention now a particular application of uh, decision trees. Yes, sir, it's a question. Uh, they don't have to be, but uh, it, it, it turns out that's the way most people uh, build uh, decision trees. Um, it's easier to represent them and uh, fast and so on. Um, so um, uh, my company, Lucina Research, has partnered with uh, PsychSignal to uh, create a strategy we call Checkmate. Um, it's classification based. Um, so what we're looking to do is create uh, decision trees that can uh, look at this data and each day predict is the uh, price going to go up uh, or is it going to go down. Um, and uh, let me tell you just a little bit about the psych signal data. Um, they uh, monitor stock twits and Twitter feeds and they're looking for sentiment uh, on each of the uh, uh, symbols that they cover. Uh, now, we take um, their factors, you know, in, in, in the uh, framework I've been talking about, uh, the psych signal data is several of those X's. It might reflect uh, intensity of sentiment, volume of sentiment, and so on. Uh, but then we also look across all of the other factors that we've got at Lucena. These are technical and fundamental and so on. And we um, build a, a tree to classify uh, whether over 21 days we think the stock is going to go up or down. Uh, it, we view it as a classification problem. Essentially, we want uh, only to classify stocks as up if they're going to go significantly up uh, with, um, uh, uh, with strong probability or down similarly with strong probability down or neutral, which is just ignore them. And in fact, we build uh, two different trees. One tree is focused on the up side, another tree is focused on the downside. So this strategy is long short. The long sides are determined by this um, up tree and the uh, short sides by the uh, down tree. So this is a um, back test um, since uh, 2011. Um, orange represents uh, the strategy itself. Uh, blue is the S&P 500. Now let me tell you how this works. Um, we trained over 2011, that's our in-sample period, and that's the first year, which I know may be hard to see. Um, uh, but then uh, in subsequent years, we're just using that model that, uh, that we've already built. Each day, we apply this tree to the data, uh, you know, like I said, combination of sentiment data and our, our other factors, and uh, we get a list of stocks that pass that screen. Um, we take the um, top five, and by top, uh, what I mean is uh, if, if there's more than five, we rank them according to one additional feature. Um, we then uh, take 5% of, of our uh, portfolio and invest it in those um, five stocks. And we repeat that every day. Uh, the, the, we automatically exit after 20 days, so we're, each day we're exiting our five oldest positions and entering five new positions. So that's the uh, long side. We repeat that for uh, a short strategy. Now, as you may know, if you're a quantitative person, it's really hard to find um, short strategies. Um, and uh, you know, I think the, the reason is intuitive, which is you know, CEOs don't go advertising, oh, my company sucks, right? Um, whereas if there's anything good, they, they promote it. So it's much easier to get inf uh, good information than, than bad information. Um, 
but uh, uh, the, the benchmark in this case is uh, SH, which is essentially um, uh, shorting uh, of the S&P 500. Um, so it's, in our experience, it's unusual to have a short strategy that actually is positive. We usually aim just to beat um, shorting the S&P 500. Uh, anyways, putting them all together, um, uh, this is uh, the orange line again represents a combination of the long side and the short side. And what we do is each day we run the long screen and the short screen and uh, we, uh, we invest uh, up to 5% of the value of the portfolio across the uh, stocks that meet, that, um, meet those criteria. And we repeat uh, every day exiting the oldest ones after 20 days. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, that's a that's a fair question. Uh, let me actually let me answer that by showing you something here. Um, there are some uh, uh, flat regions here. Um, that's when uh, so this is the short strategy. Uh, it's not identifying any shorts during that period. We just uh, in in we're in that situation presently. We just were long only, and similarly, when there's no long triggers, we're short only. It's not, uh, it's not dollar uh, balanced. Um, even so, it's been uh, uh, robust in, in down markets. Now, um, you've never seen a bad back test, right? Um, so uh, we're forward testing it now. We don't have uh, funds applied to it yet, but this is um, uh, each morning, this is since uh, uh, November uh, last year, uh, each morning we, uh, we run the algorithm, uh, see our long triggers and short triggers, uh, uh, enter those positions uh, in paper trading, and uh, orange is the uh, performance of that strategy um, over these last uh, uh, four months. Um, it's, got, um, it's got a sharp ratio of 4.7, uh, which I, I've never seen that. Um, uh, so we're, we're, you know, of all the strategies we've created, this one is, is, uh, is, is, is really uh, uh, doing well in paper trading. When you actually apply money, um, you, you can't expect to keep, uh, keep that sort of sharp ratio because, you know, it's like um, Schrodinger, you know, in order to um, observe the mark, you know, you know what I'm saying. Um, so we're not, I, I'm not trying to tell you, okay, we're going to get a sharp ratio of four. But, uh, uh, huh? Uh, yes, we have uh, slippage and uh, commissions and so on. Um, okay, there's a couple more things I want to get through. Um, uh, so far I've been talking about decision trees. I want to talk just briefly about another mechanism for solving the same problem. It's called uh, K nearest neighbor. Um, here we've got examples of uh, data points in a space. So one dimension here is say one factor, the other dimension is another factor, and each of these points is um, uh, colored according to what the outcome was. So blues might have been uh, do nothing, reds might have been the stock price went down, green might be that it went up. Um, the, uh, the way you train a K-nearest neighbor learner is you just save all the data. That's the entire training process. You stick it in RAM, okay? <laughs> uh, the query, uh, is more complicated, but let's say you want to ask, okay, this is my query point, this is my X1 and X2 for today, what is my prediction? Well, what you do is you go to that point in your space and you find the K nearest neighbors. So uh, in this case, uh, we're finding the five nearest neighbors, and if it's a classification problem, you just have those neighbors vote. So in this case, there's four blues and one red, blue wins. Um, and that's the way, that's the way K nearest neighbor works. So I only need one slide for that. <laughs> uh, but it can also work for regression. Uh, you don't, uh, I, I showed you a classification problem, but the values in, at those points could be how much did the price change. So just like decision trees, uh, you can use them for regression or classification. I want to show you real quickly uh, use of K nearest neighbor. 
This is on, uh, this is uh, our platform at Lucina called uh, QuantDesk. Um, we, uh, uh, we, we, we generate predictions for uh, one week, two weeks, uh, one month, every day across uh, all of the Russell 1000. Um, we use K nearest neighbor, which I just described for you. Uh, the um, tricky part is which features to use. Um, we've got over 450 features. Um, I, I won't go into deep detail, but, but I'll say each weekend we run a, a long computing process to find about the 10 best features, and then our predictions for that foregoing week are all based on those features. Um, th this I just ran this morning, um, and presently the, um, the features are all uh, technical features that it thinks are, are currently the best. Uh, and uh, uh, do you ever get those phone calls, uh, hey, I got a stock tip for you, I want you to write it down, and, uh, um, and then they call you back a month later and, and say, hey, did, how'd that stock do? Nobody gets those calls. Okay, I get them all the time. I don't know. Anyways, I say, I, I ask them what their sharp ratio is, and then they hang up. Um, uh, anyways, here's my stock tip. Um, uh, our learner thinks Home Depot is going to go up 1.2% over the next week. So remember that. If it succeeds, I'll call you up. Um, if not, then uh, my talk was garbage. Um, but anyways, in, in, in reality, it's not perfect. Um, uh, and in fact, having even a slight correlation between the prediction and the outcomes uh, is, is tough. Um, one thing I will tell you is in our experience, a correlation between a, a good model and what it predicts and what the actual outcome is a good one, one that you can make money with, uh, is 0.12. Um, and that's just enough to overcome uh, transaction costs. Um, okay, this will be, I'm going to skip reinforcement learning because I'm running out of time. Uh, but let me talk um, briefly about the trade-offs between these two types of supervised learning. And when you're, if you're selecting a type of learning algorithm that you want to use, these are at least a, subset of the things that you ought to uh, consider. Um, so you need to ask yourself, am I doing a classification problem or a regression problem? Make sure that the algorithm you're selecting can do that. Uh, consider the environment. If you're, a, um, if you're going to be doing high frequency trading, uh, KNN is probably not the best solution because it's very slow at query time. Uh, on the other hand, decision trees can be uh, very, very fast. Um, I didn't get into it, but um, uh, KNN requires that you normalize your features. In other words, you want most of your features to range over about the same uh, uh, range, usually negative one to one is what we use. Um, if you don't do that, so let's imagine you have one of your features goes from negative 1,000 to 1,000, and another feature goes from negative one to one. The distance between points will be overwhelmed by this 1,000 feature and it'll turn out that that's the only one that matters. So you have to go through a massaging process to, to make your data normalized. Decision trees, you don't have to do that. It ends, decision trees end up uh, resolving that uh, for you uh, automatically. Both are subject to overfitting. Uh, with K nearest neighbor, you can address that with larger K um, or ensemble learners. Um, uh, with decision trees, um, I, I didn't go into the detail, but Instead of having each leaf represent just one data point, you can throw 100 data points in there and take the mean of all those data points as the value of the, of the leaf. If you make the leaf size larger, you're much less susceptible to overfitting. Uh, KNN, you need to figure out what your features are going to be somehow in advance. Uh, decision trees, I won't say they're perfect at this, but to some extent, they discover which features uh, work best um, in an automatic way. Uh, finally, with both approaches, uh, you need to um, take whatever the outcome of your learner is and map that to some strategy. In other words, uh, uh, how do you allocate? How much of the different things do you buy? You know, if the prediction is it'll go up 5%, do I allocate the most to that and so on? Um, and uh, uh, sometimes that mapping to a strategy and allocation is, is a big challenge, um, which leads into the next topic that you will have to come to my talk next year to learn about, um, which is reinforcement learning. But I will um, skip that uh, this time. So um, 
let me um, close. And if you want to learn about my company, that's our website. If you're interested in that course, um, Google Balch Udacity, and it'll take you to that. But uh, thanks for your attention. Do I still have five minutes? Um, you okay. Uh, at the next part of machine learning, would you say that it's possible to really use it in financial markets where the signal to noise is really much lower than all other fields that have been applied successfully? Um, so the, uh, the, the question was, um, uh, is machine learning, because the signal to noise ratio is so low, um, right. Uh, so I would say if you have some method that has a higher signal to noise ratio, use it. Um, but uh, the one thing to, to, to make a point about is uh, all successful machine learning strategies that I've seen start with a good idea from a human. And the machine learning is used to refine that idea. We don't just throw machine learning out there and, and hope that it works. So for instance, uh, in this strategy I talked about with psych signal, we started with the hypothesis that the psych signal data is valuable. And then we use machine learning to find additional factors that built on top of that. Uh, so machine learning just by itself, uh, no, I, I, I wouldn't use. Um, OK, I should close. Um, I will go out there if anybody has any other questions, and I'll be glad to, um, glad to answer. Uh, thanks very much.